So welcome everyone to this uh, first installment of the uh, Ian Ramsey Centre Humane Philosophy Project seminar series of this calendar year. We'd like to thank, as always, the sponsors of the project, uh, the uh, Institute of Philosophy, now the Faculty of Philosophy, I believe, at the University of Warsaw, the Ian Ramsey Centre for Science and Religion, the John Templeton Foundation, and also Blackfriars Hall, Oxford, although we are today meeting here at the Faculty of Theology and Religion. I'm immensely pleased to introduce today Professor Agnieszka Lekakovalik, who is Professor of Philosophy at the John Paul II Catholic University of Lublin. Agnieszka has a Master's in Chemistry, a PhD in Habilitation in Philosophy, and from 1993 to 1996, she was Associate uh, Faculty, Associate Professor at uh, the University de uh, Neuchâtel. She joined Lublin in 1997, and since 2011, she served as chair of the Department of the Methodology of the Sciences. She was vice dean in 2009 to 2012, vice rector uh, in 2012 to 2013, and since 2021, she's been vice president of the Polish Association for Technology Assessment uh, and since May, a member of the working group Fundamental Values of the Bologna Follow-Up Group. She's published many influential works, uh, principally in philosophy, but in a wide range of areas. These include, in English, Morality uh, in the AI World in Law and Business uh, 2021, Technology Analysis and the Need for a Value Framework in the uh, volume multidisciplinary aspects of production engineering and uh, a number of similar works listed on our website. But today Agnieszka is going to talk to us about sciences and the future of religion. So I'd ask you to join me in giving her a very warm welcome. Uh, thank you for in inviting me for introducing me, and thank you all for coming uh, to listen. I will attempt to be as clear as possible and a little bit provocative, because I think that this is an important question for all of us, whether we are philosophers, theologians, or just ordinary chemists. Here is my starting point. I take the term religion to refer here to Christianity for obvious reasons. Uh, you cannot do everything at uh, once, uh, taking into account um, how many religions um, are in the world. The second thing, I take science uh, to cover natural and social sciences. The reason is that they are seen as, let us say, competitors, uh, not really the humanities. How I approach uh, the problem of the relationship between science and the future of religion. I want to analyze a project a project of replacing uh, religion with science. And I take it to be a global postulate, not just locally than in certain community, but on the whole. There are two versions of that project of replacing religion with science. One is quite radical. It's uh, the claim that science is a path to God, much better than any uh, religion. And I will not consider this version of the project. You have the author and a quotation the second version uh, has its roots in the Enlightenment, 
And this is the claim that science provides a sufficient understanding on everything. And therefore, there is no need of uh, uh, religion. And here I will consider the second version of the project of replacing religion with science. The plan of my presentation, four simple points. The first one, I will present the idea of the project, replacing Christianity with science, then showing uh, what is replaced, or what should be replaced, or what is replaceable, and therefore I will show how nature was attributed God's powers, and then that's just drawing consequences of that step. Then I consider the problem of moral norms and then ask a question, is it possible to replace uh, moral norms relig uh, motivated by religion with, let us say, science-based norms? And then I draw consequences. Let us look at the postulate. This postulate of replacing science, uh, replacing religion with science is designed in the name of rationality. That is, science can or even should, I will quote some versions of that um, should claim, should replace religion in our social life. Sometimes it's even seen as a mission of science. Of course, there are reasons behind the project. I will not consider reasons. It's a different question. I will consider the project in itself, so to speak. Of course, there are two classical thinkers. One is uh, John uh, William uh, Draper, and you have here, uh, I will display a quotation in a moment, but the important uh, term is here, natural competitors, because they explain the same world. Here you have a longer quotation from uh, Draper. He clashes. Uh, the intolerant revelation that must repudiate all improvements and the human reason as developed or shown in sciences, uh, which is in constant progress. So, when we have such a situation, something which is stable and dogmatic, which is religion, and then reason, which is progressive, of course, we should, in the name of human rationality, we should be on the side of reason. Here's another classic thinker, Renan. And uh, Renan uh, says a similar thing, and then you have a famous quotation. My religion is now, as ever, the progress of reason. In other words, the progress of science. So you have two classical thinkers, uh, the 19th century. But of course, it's not an old-fashioned problem. Now, you have uh, some hints. You have Steven Weinberg, a physicist, who claims that the world needs to wake up from the long nightmare of religion. And that's, he says, that that's the mission of scientists to, so to speak, get rid of religion. 
you have, of course, some Harris, who um, says a similar thing like uh, Draper. So he says that the success of science comes sometimes at the expense of religious dogma. But the keeping the religious dogma always comes at the expense of science. In other words, if we wish to have science, we need to get rid of uh, religion. Uh, you have here two books. One uh, is Sanus, Life Without God, a guide to ful fulfillment without religion. And then McCoy, The Language of Meaning, Why Science Cannot Replace Religion. And then there is a book uh, in Polish, Will Science Replace uh, Religion? So the question, can science or should science replace religion, is still being posed and it's still valid. The question which I will uh, debate today is, is this project feasible and desirable? But see the nature of the problem itself. This is a philosophical question, or I ev can even say methodological question. So it's not a psychological question. So I will not be bringing data uh, about how many believers uh, there are in the world, etc. I will not talk about functions of religions. It's a different, it's a different question. So I will be asking what and why can or should be replaced. The very core uh, of my presentation is the term replacing. What does it mean when I say to replace? I do not mean that the project asks to, I would say, uh, close churches or close the institution of any uh, church. I'm not claiming uh, that the project says that people may not search for emotions, consolations, anything. The term replacing means here that religion, Christian religion, as I mentioned, I'm talking about Christianity, Christianity cannot be a source of any serious understanding of the world, of any serious understanding of reality. The world, the human being in it, uh, norms governing our life and social life, etc. So it's on the level of cognition, not emotions, not attachments, and not even institutions. It's a different question whether uh, it, uh, the institution uh, of rel any religious institution should be replaced by a scientific institution. What are presuppositions behind um, uh, that idea? Well, the first is that science gives epistemic criteria. Uh, epistemic criteria, which cognition is reliable, which cognition should be, which uh, thesis should be um, rationally accepted. Well, from the point of view of that project, religion does not fulfill that criteria. 
And this is one of the reasons why it should be replaced. Well, science develops and takes up questions that earlier uh, belonged to religion. For example, the question of wisdom. See contemporary psychology, where there is a uh, big talk of uh, wisdom. And the last presupposition is that the human being is rational. Uh, that is, we should accept, I'm saying we should accept, not necessarily making the claim that we are all uh, accepting, uh, that we should accept only what has justification and to the degree that justification allows us to accept. So a very crude view of human rationality, but it's quite important here. Now, the first question is, uh, when we are talking, it's too general, science and religion. So the first question is, what should be replaced within that project? <sighs> there are hundreds of definitions of religion. So what I did, I checked encyclopedias, various encyclopedias, and detected the constituents of religion. Four of them are listed practically in all definitions. It's a doctrine. So a set of statements concerning uh, God and his relation uh, to the world and to us. Then cult, so practices, practices um, that maintain, the practices that aim at maintaining uh, the contact uh, with uh, God, worshipping God, etc. Then norms are uh, determining um, religiously motivated morality and customs. So not only norm norms, but also customs. Then uh, social institution to transfer the doctrine, uh, morality, and to perform worship. And sometimes you see emotional attitudes towards God and values. So now the question is, if we take seriously the idea that science should replace religion, wi but uh, without necessarily presupposing that institutions will be closed and that people will be not attached to religion, etc., which of the constituents can be uh, or at least potentially are replaceable. Well, <sighs> doctrine and norms, and I will consider these uh, two things, and I will show why. Well, there are some theses behind the constituents of religion. They are easy, I just listed uh, in a very simplified form. God exists, God is the creator of the world and human persons. Uh, he remains in a particular relation to us and the world. God revealed <coughs> his presence and the ultimate goal of human being. And this allows us to specify what could be uh, expected of believers. So moral norms, virtues, customs, etc. And the existence of God, the purpose of human person, and the content of norms are cognitively accessible to believers. They are revealed and they are maintained uh, in the tradition. So, if we accept the view that science should replace the doctrine, then it should offer 
another explanation for those uh, facts such as the existence of the world and the existence of the human being in the world, etc. So we should think that there is no God who created the human being in his image and likeness and gave the human being the ultimate goal and norms to lead to heaven, to the unity with God. Well, science is a set of theories that aim at explaining the workings of reality, including us and our acting. It is progressive. So we, sh we know more and more about the world, about the human being. And therefore, there is a hope that we can, so to speak, forget on a cognitive level those claims of religion and simply take the views of science. I like the, the, the way Popper presented uh, Francis Bacon. You have here the quotation. He, I mean Francis Bacon, replaced the name God by the name nature, nature, but he left almost everything else unchanged. Theology, the science of God, was replaced by the science of nature. The laws of God were replaced by the laws of nature. God's power was replaced by the forces of nature. At a later date, God's design and God's judgment were replaced by natural selection. Theological determinism was replaced by scientific determinism and the book of fate by the predictability of nature. In short, God's omnipotence and omniscience was replaced by that of nature and virtually by natural science. I abbreviated the last. So you see the idea of replacing. Well, God was uh, seen as all-powerful, but nature is not. But science, potentially, uh, is why systematically working, uh, developing a systematic inquiry into nature, he is able to control the forces of nature. So science really provides us knowledge and understanding of nature, human beings including. So, in this sense, science offers a doctrine. So, the final knowledge about the sources, structure, development and functioning of reality. Even human phenomena should be explained by the appeal to natural structures and natural forces. I suppose you read papers about love explained in terms of chemistry and about genes of infidelity and you have even the genes of religiosity. So this is why we are interested in that. If you look at such claims, such claims presuppose not only uh, methodological naturalism, but also ontological naturalism, that is, which boils down to materialism, not really. I mean, you can use a fancy name, ontological uh, naturalism, but Finally, it means nature is everything what exists, and everything what exists is a form of matter. Okay, but now we know 
a long-standing debate between the arguments for the existence of God and against the existence of God. So are we facing a choice, materialism versus theism, with arguments on both sides? If this is so, then any project of replacing sci uh, religion with science cognitively would employ power. Saying that you may be attached, but you should not believe in such claims that God created the human being in his image and likeness. And the second thing, the issue of moral norms. Uh, Christianity offers a claim uh, concerning the final uh, goal of human life and therefore indicating certain norms to achieve that goal. If science is to replace religion, it should offer also the explanation and the content of moral norms. Um, it is so because both uh, s traditions, I mean religious tradition and secularist tradition agrees, both agree that human beings are moral agents. So let us consider. Here you have a number of positive answers to that question. Well, you have uh, Sam Harris. If we consider human action, it is morally good if it increases the well-being of conscious creatures. Uh, I will not consider uh, conscious creatures all, but simply human beings. Also, uh, another uh, quotation, another term, human flourishing, is a state in which all aspects of person's life are good. So terms that are to capture the norm, the final norm of science-based morality are flourishing, happiness, or well-being. Let us notice that all those uh, terms are value-laden, and we know the problem with uh, value-laden terms. Uh, presuppositions. The term flourishing uh, should capture the objectively uh, good state, not objectively good state for the human being. And if this is the objective good state, it gives you a sort of moral norms, namely, you should flourish. This flourishing, this norm, you ought to flourish, has a normative power in two senses. On one hand, I should strive for that state. If this is the something that I should achieve, the fullness of me as a human being, etc. But it should also bind other people that they should allow me to flourish. Any norm, if we accept the presupposition of rationality, is in need of justification. How can we justify the norm, you ought to flourish? Here is a quotation, I think it captures the main problem that there is no non-circular way to justify that 
norm. You may appeal to happiness, but then why should I strive for happiness, etc., etc. But even if we somehow justify the norm I should flourish, how can I justify the norm you should promote flourishing of others? I found two arguments why I should promote flourishing of Ralph <laughs> Mikoe. The first one, the flourishing of others is a condition of my own flourishing. So if they are going better, I'm doing better because they might invite me or whatever. <laughs> A nice egoism, right? Well, there is another argument, namely, well, I should flourish because it's part of the flourishing of species, of our species. Successful, it's a successful evolution of our species. But what is so special about our species? Can you ask a scientist and ask why our species should be protected or flourish or anything like that? Okay, so now we have a problem right now uh, with justification of the norm you ought to flourish. Well, there is another problem. Because you need to give not only the norm, but also the content of that norm. So you, ha you need to answer the, quest uh, the question, what constitutes human flourishing? Well, it seems that when you search for an answer to that question, your answer become, uh, becomes very individualistic. And who should tell me what constitutes my flourishing? Maybe in a particular moment of my life, I wish to enjoy a um, philosophical discussion. But maybe in another moment, I wish to e experience infidelity to my husband. Can you decide on the scientific basis which of the two is a way to flourish for me? I cannot find a sufficient justification saying uh, that. Well, you have an example, another example, if you have two drug addicts, mm -hmm. and one says, well, I refuse to go to a hospital because I prefer excitement and big experience. And if I live short, that's my choice. And the other says, oh no, I would like to go to a hospital. Can you tell why one of those decisions is better from the point of view of science? And that's another, and the last one. Science gives us means, that's pretty obvious to solve certain problems that constitute obstacles to our flourishing. But the final thing is death. And we see a sort of proof if you go to a, trans to a transhumanist movement. The final thing is we wish to be immortal. 
Well, why so? Because if there is this perspective of the final death, so to speak, flourishing uh, loses much of its appeal. One of our philosophers from my school, uh, Yudicki, calls this axiological catastrophe. If I'm done, so to speak, even after 118 years, I think it was the last, the, the, the nun, French nun died, I think she was 118. But why should I flourish? Okay, is Christian ethics doing better in that respect? Um, Again, Christian ethics is too broad. So uh, I appeal uh, to the tradition of the Lublin philosophical school, which, is the which has its origin uh, Aristotle and St. Thomas, but as I already explained to Ralph, St. Thomas was not a Thomist. So you need to you need to remember that philosophy solves uh, problems, uh, not comments on um, authors. Authors bring inspirations. O authors bring bring solutions, not to open open the doors, uh, but it's not uh, the only one. Well, here is the view which is developed in the Lublin school. The first claim, Christian ethics, as designed the Lublin philosophical school, shares with science one thing, the fundam discovering the fundamental mor moral norm is a matter of experience. So, there is no difference in this particular moment. Here is something that is claimed to discover as the moral norm. Persona est affirmanda propter se ipsum. The human person should be affirmed for herself. I'm using herself uh, not because I exclude gentlemen here from personhood, <laughs> but because the term osoba, which is person in Polish, is uh, female. Uh, um. Okay. Suppose you've discovered that norm, but there is a follow-up question. What is so special? in human persons, that they should be affirmed. Well, now we start doing something which is called normative anthropology. <sighs> to put it simply, we say, well, person, pers uh, the person possesses a certain feature which we call dignity. And this dignity binds us. So there are things that I should not do uh, to persons. Or I should affirm uh, this person by doing good things for her or to her. But that's not the end of the story. <coughs> but how come that we possess? that special kind of dignity. Is this something voted? There are reasons not to think so. Um, if you know the name Father uh, Joseph Bochensky, Joseph Bochensky claimed that if crocodiles uh, had a language, they would, they would invent crocodilism. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are going back to the fundamental question. Why the human person uh, is, um, possesses this dignity? And now, 
We are appealing to God's love, who love the human person so much that he gave his son, that we have eternal life. And why so? Well, we know since God created us, he, so to speak, knows what happiness consists in, in the union with God through cognition and love. Here, St. Thomas, I'm not saying anything special. So, how can we achieve that happiness? Well, by doing, uh, or by being in the image and likeness of God in our actions. Does it mean that we are never mistaken? Of course not. We are mistaken. Is it not that we are learning something new, that certain things we thought uh, they affirmed the human person. Now we know that they are not. Yes. But then we have the role of science. Because when we are asking the question of what affirms that particular human person in this particular moment, sometimes we need to appeal to science. Is it a good norm, feed the hungry? Probably everybody says, yes, sure. Well, not when that person had a stomach operation. Mm -hmm. uh, so, <laughs> we're just learning things. That's nothing new. You have a quotation from the preface to boil usefulness of natural philosophy. It has been noticed that science allows us to be good, so to speak, giving us knowledge and means to act. But this is why we need to distinguish uh, the two ethics. You have here a quotation, but the upshot is that the norm you ought to flourish and the norm persona est affirmanda sometimes give you the same solution to a problem and sometimes not. So we need to distinguish these two ethics because they might have a different content and justification of ethical judgments. Conclusions. Well, the project of repla replacing Christianity with science, it's not really feasible or even desirable from the point of view of rationality. Remember, they designed the project in the name of rationality. My claim, the project fails to respect human rationality. The first thing is that the project assumes ontological naturalism uh, that is as justified or uh, unjustified as the claim of Christian <coughs> doctrine. So carrying on the project would require employing power. And the second thing, uh, science does not explain and justify the morality of flourishing. The Christian ethics does provide uh, such a justification. And even for the name, it's a new thing, but nevertheless I put that on a slide, because you, you will not flourish as a person unless you affirm a person, oneself, and other eyes. So it seems to be more rational <laughs> because it explains uh, both persona est affirmanda and 
the norm you ought to flourish. Um, the scientific materialist must reject religion in the name of science if he wants to be consistent. For a Christian, the alternative science or religion is a typical false dilemma. And from the point of view of the project, religion has no future. But from the point of Christianity, science does and should have uh, the future. So it seems we should not support the project of replacing religion with science. Thank you for Thank your you. attention. Thank you very much, Professor Lekakovalik, for a, a really uh, clear, interesting, and uh, wide-ranging talk. We do have available 10 or 20 minutes for questions. And I think what we'll do is uh, I'll bring you the microphone so you can speak into it so your question is captured on our video footage. But if you were to say something you'd like not to be uh, preserved for all posterity, we can always edit it out later. So. Uh, uh, raise your hand if you would like to ask a, a, a question. Um, I was just wondering, um, so um, I, I, I don't know the, the uh, literature that well on the authors who suggest that uh, uh, science should replace uh, uh, religion, uh, sort of, you know, one-to-one, one one, all, its, all its aspects, but uh, it sort of strikes me that you don't need to replace the religious hope with uh, a sort of a surrogate of, of the same kind of hope, uh, but based on science. You might just say the hope was completely forlorn and it's being replaced by despair. <laughs> um, so, so, of course, where science fails to provide uh, a, a substitute for the Christian hope, for the afterlife, for the grounding of morality and so forth, you know, human dignity, moral value, moral worth and, and, and so on. Science might say, well, we've shown these are illusions, and the value of that is that we've shown something true. Uh, uh, and so I wonder how that fits into, into um, what, 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 what you were saying, which I otherwise uh, completely agree with. <laughs> Science uh, might say, that's what you, what you just said, cognitively, on the level of reason, you should accept only scientific claims. If you think that being together and, uh, with other people, uh, sharing your faith in afterlife and singing songs, consolates you, fine with you. But it does not mean that you, you said the absolutely crucial term truth because <laughs> it's if you say science should replace religion it's cognitively not emotionally it means that it should claim that real science should say that religious claims concerning the existence of God uh, life after um, after life and all other things, that they are simply false in a very uh, basic sense of the term truth, adequatio intellectus uh, uh, et rei. But some people, uh, to console themselves, uh, read crime stories. I mean, why not? Uh, I didn't say that explicitly. But you, the project does not say that you need to close churches or institutions of any uh, so, uh, uh, religious institutions. They just say that I like sort of other clubs. <laughs> if we meet, we sing together. It's not quite serious. The problem starts when it, it comes to social life. And then science says, well, you should not use religious claims 
to organize our social life. And, but nevertheless, psychologists talk a lot about flourishing. Now recently, they talk a lot about wisdom, I suppose, in connection with flourishing. But then we run to the problem. Is it cognitively justified, the norm, you ought to flourish? Well, it's your private decision. So we are facing here a very basic thing. I mean, either <laughs> it's true or false, an illusion. And I see no other option here as to invoke truth mm. in this in this context. There is a question here. I was just thinking about that science and religion, the purpose of both science and religion is to be for the best of the humanity. To be for the best of the humanity. Is there possibility in future, instead of science and religion to be separate thing, maybe at the spiritual level or at some level, science and religion, they become one, they, they merge together at some stage, at the advanced level or somewhere. What do you think about it? Apparently, religion <laughs> is plan B <laughs> because uh, in the paradise, what was uh, Adam doing? Well, science, naming, things, classifying <laughs> things, etc. Only the f f fall, so to speak, separated, uh, separated uh, the thing. So I cannot answer how the, the, the thing develops. The only thing which I would uh, not argue but ask you said religion and science is for the good of humanity. Why? What's so special about human being that we need to invest thousands of euros and pounds and, and zlotis to develop a new material or new, uh, new medicine, for example? What's so special? And that's the problem, uh, because we keep claiming a special status of the human species. How can we justify that special status? And religion steps in here, I mean Christianity steps in here, uh, again saying God created us with love, and after the fall, he wishes, uh, he wants, because of his love, uh, he wants us back, so to speak, to the union with, with God. And one of the things is, of course, uh, our cognitive uh, powers. It's even the idea that technology, it's a Puritan idea, not uh, Catholic, but there was a, a formulation that technology is a gift of God to restore paradise. So the, this, let us say, Hegelian hope of reunification is grounded uh, in uh, the Christian doctrine. Mm -hmm. But uh, outside you know, criticism, what we did to the earth, what we are doing to human people right now, and you probably know the debate around transhumanism uh, right now. And well, Ralph already chat with chat, uh, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> And uh, there are a lot of uh, conferences right now. For example, um, sex with, um, 
how could I say rub Robot. it's not even robots anymore because they are not simply doing algorithmic things they are learning from experience so to justify <laughs> the claim that everything for is for the sake of humanity we need more than uh, just science, let us say. So that's my long answer to a short question. <laughs> what I'd like to know what you make of attempts at middle ground positions that find, in particular with respect to a source of normativity that is uh, not scientific, at least on a narrow conception of science, but not uh, appealing to religion either. So I think uh, you know, there are these people, Sam Harris and so forth, who think that, that natural science will somehow get us everything. But uh, there are some people who would say, no, no, uh, okay, to get normativity, we might need to expand natural science at least to bring back teleology w rather than efficient causation. Once you have natural teleology, maybe we can just from analyzing uh, organisms work out what is flourishing for them. And then there are others in the sort of long-standing tradition, maybe starting with uh, uh, Kant in the modern period, of trying to just find a source for morality uh, in human nature itself, in the nature of rationality. Maybe the foremost proponent of that a version of that idea recently is Derek Parfit, who sort of says, there are these objective moral truths. They really exist. They're not part of a natural world described by science. I think he says they have non-ontological being, which might be regarded as a contradiction concealed by uh, two, two different languages. But, but at least these are popular views about how we can have real objective norms with uh, an authoritative source that uh, is at least maybe a little bit closer to science than uh, the doctrine of a revealed religion. Uh, I guess that's the question. What about everything the talk wasn't on? But, but perhaps you could comment. <laughs> Uh, suppose, well, we are in a former building of a hospital, am I right? Okay, so it's a good example. You are um, on the uh, stairs of a hospital and you are debated with your friend. Uh, you are debating with your friend. Should I, we tell our common friend that he's dying? One person says, no way. The other says, of course we should. Okay. So there is a hot debate. What is the condition of the rationality of that debate? It's, I mean, P non P. What is the condition of the rationality? Well, they both want the best for the friend. And that's uh, when we are debating such things, the presupposition says precisely what you said. We find normativity, let us say, in the essence of human being. So the S, the, the I'm, I do not like the language of essences, but I have no choice right now to search for better wording. The essence of human being is normative in the following sense. When we encounter the human being, it requires from us, and we notice that empirically. Do good, avoid evil. The debate is between these two. The debate is what is really good for uh, the friend. So full agreement. We are on the level of experience. And you said one very important uh, thing going beyond a narrow conception of experience. <laughs> because uh, in natural uh, sciences, what you have, you gather data 
and then you put generalizations. That's not the only experience you have. If you see a person kicking a child, are you considering whether it's Kantian, Aristotelian, and I think you are trying to stop? Why? Because you noticed something. That's your experience. That something is wrong in this particular situation. So here's full agreement on this empirical, uh, on this empirical level. The second um, point of agreement is that we are learning what is good for the human person. So there is, <laughs> let us say, progress in the knowledge what is good, uh, what is morally good. Uh, see how careful I am. Progress in the knowledge, not necessarily in obeying. Some people mix up these two, uh, these two uh, things. So there is a second point of agreement. But now, we are going back to the issue. Essence, the human essence has this normative dimension that binds me. So I cannot do certain things to you because you are the human being. Or I should do certain things because you are the human being. But now, uh, in the name of rationality, I can ask about sources of that normativity. And what now? What can you do with this question? You cannot say you, you are not allowed to ask that question. <laughs> you have to face the question and how can you have that normativity? One is the solution Mm, saying that we are special because of God's love. You may have another uh, solution. You may say, well, we are special because of, I don't know, social decisions. But that's hi historically non not true. So do we have a better answer to that particular to that particular uh, question. I'm not doing theology right now. I'm not developing the knowledge of God, etc. I'm bringing God as uh, an explanation. I took from theology the idea, but I'm bringing as an explanation, not uh, as a dogma in this particular moment. If you join me in thanking once again our speaker, Agnieszka Lekakowalik, for her wonderful talk. Thank you for your attention.